Mark chapter 1. We're going to start reading at verse 21 this morning as we continue in our series on the Gospel of Mark. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Grass withers, flowers fade, leaves fall from the trees. The seasons change, thanks be to God. But thanks be to God, the word of God does not change. It shall abide forever. Thanks be to God. One of my all-time favorite verses in the Bible is where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, Satan is really the one who is cowering in, in fear and we as believers are the ones who are assaulting his citadel. I intend this message to be, today to be an assault on the kingdom of darkness on all the powers of Satan and his minions. And I want to help us see not only the reality of that kingdom, that, but the power of Jesus Christ that he has rendered and will render uh, Satan's kingdom helpless. The story that we're looking at this morning uh, is according to Mark, at least, Jesus' first public act of ministry. Not a healing, as Matthew's gospel tells it. Uh, not turning water into wine, as John records it in his gospel. No, Jesus' first miracle, according to Mark, is an exorcism. Why should we look at this story today? Several reasons. I think probably first of all what comes to mind is, is because Ephesians 6 commands us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power so that we can, you and I can, take our stand against the devil's schemes. He's scheming against us. Or because, as Peter writes, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That someone, by the way, in that text, is you. Satan's minions don't waste their time prowling around trying to devour unbelievers. Unless somehow, by doing that, they're able to get to a Christian. That's the objective. We're also looking at this story today because it helps us as a church to fulfill one of God's purposes for us as a church, following the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone is under the control of a demonic spirit, they need to be set free from that spirit before they can come into the fullness and the freedom of life in Jesus Christ. Think of Mary Magdalene out of whom Jesus cast seven demons, but who came, became one of the most ardent followers of Jesus throughout his ministry. I have three points for our consideration today. First of all, this passage reminds us that we must clearly understand the reality of spiritual warfare. Friends, we live in a combat zone. 
Now, if you were serving in the Army or the Marine Corps or some of the other branches of the service, and I told you that, uh, you know, if you were in Afghanistan or Iraq or some other place where we're engaged in literal combat, uh, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. But our senses get dulled to the reality of that. But I'm here to tell you that we are living in a combat zone. God told us in Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, uh, against the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Anybody remember a book that came out back in the 1960s by a guy named Hal Lindsey? Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. Anybody remember that book? There's a conflict that's going on in the heavenly realms, but Lindsay wanted to help us understand that it's also going on in planet Earth. It's going on in Forest Grove. It's going on in Hudsonville and everywhere around us. Now, there are three key battlegrounds in this spiritual war, our minds and the church and society. 1 John 5.19 says, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. This is his playground. This is his territory. This is his principality. We as a nation uh, know that we are involved in an unending war on terrorism. Our president, our military leaders, Department of Homeland Security people often remind us that this war on terrorism is not a war that's going to end anytime soon. But the battle that's been going on with ISIS and with the Taliban and other such organizations is small, friends, compared to the cosmic battle, the universal battle that has been going on in the world since the fall of man. The real war on terror has been going on since that event that occurred in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve fell into sin, we hear God speaking these words to Satan, to the deceiver. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He, and that's a reference to Christ, okay, to the Son of God. He will crush your head, Satan, and you will strike his heel. What happened there, as we all are fairly familiar with that Genesis 3 story, is that Adam and Eve decided to just kind of be friendly with, uh, even be partners with the deceiver, the serpent. But God, out of his jealous love for his people, declared war on that relationship. He said, I am going to create conflict, enmity between you and the deceiver for the rest of time. I love you too much to simply let you go on, so I am going to declare war on that relationship. So from now on, there will be enmity. There will be tension. There will be stress. There will be conflict. There will be a fight to the death between you, the offspring of Eve, and Satan. But we need to take hope because, friends, this is not going to be an eternal conflict. Uh, scripture is clear that one day Jesus Christ is going to put all of God's enemies under his feet. The book of Revelation says that ultimately Satan is going to be vanquished. He's going to be thrown into the fiery lake of sulfur and he's going to be done forever. I could hear an amen. <laughs> Living hope. We sang about that, right? Let's move on. I find it interesting that the demon who speaks out of the man in the synagogue in Mark chapter 1 says, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? I'd, I'd use my Schmeagel voice this morning if I could make that work, but I'm, I'm not going to try. <laughs> Have you come to destroy us? Do you know that Jesus' answer to that question could have been a resounding, Yes, <laughs> yes, I could, <laughs> or I did come for that. 
I take that from scripture. Take a look at these words found in 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. There it is. So the reason that Jesus came to earth was to reverse the curse. Has nothing to do with the Chicago Cubs, by the way. But to reverse the curse that fell upon humanity in the Garden of Eden. His mission was to undo all the damage that Satan had done to us, to God's people. He wasn't here just to teach us. He wasn't here just to give us a perfect example. Jesus had a much higher purpose to rescue, to deliver, to redeem, to go toe-to-toe with Satan, who led Adam and Eve into the first sin and who has been plaguing humanity with sin and rebellion ever since. So first of all, we simply need to understand the reality of this spiritual war we're in. Secondly, we must recognize and be alert to the devil's work. Countless places in the scripture, it says, be watchful, be sober, be wary, be alert, be on your guard. Friends, God wouldn't tell us to do that uh, if it weren't for the activity of a fierce adversary who is coming against us. What exactly is the devil's work? Have you ever thought about that? To go back to that verse we looked at a moment ago in 1 John 3, verse 8, the first part of that verse says this, He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So that verse tells us that the devil's work, primary work, is to lead people into sin, to get angry, or to be jealous, or you know, you name it. Listen to what John goes on to say in verse 10, two verses later. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. So Satan wants to get us to sin. It's rebellion against God, sin at its core. That's what Satan tried to get Jesus to do, remember, uh, in the 40-day temptation in the wilderness? To get him to sin. And if Satan didn't leave Jesus alone, knowing that he was the Son of God, he's not going to leave you alone. The devil spends his time, all of his time, and he never sleeps, as far as I know. He spends his time harassing us, harassing the church. Did you notice where this event in Mark's gospel takes place? It happened in church. It was actually a Jewish synagogue, but hey, that was church for the Jews. Right? Look at verse 23 again. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out. So the, there's a man in church who's dangerous. He's demon-filled, but he blends right in with all the rest of the worshipers. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Unlike the Gerasene demoniac, that story we'll look at in Mark chapter 5, several weeks from now, uh, who people called wild and weird and scary, this man looks like everybody else sitting in the pew, except he's deadly. He's ready and willing to wreak havoc in their fellowship. Let's look at something that James says about this. James chapter 3, verses 13 to 16. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, quote unquote, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, look at this, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So where does James say that this earthly thinking, this selfish ambition comes from? Clearly, 
from the devil. Brothers and sisters, sins of selfish ambition, sins of pride, and the desire to take control in the church and to have it your way are what I call the primal sins. Primal in the sense that they go back to the very beginning. They go back to the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve wanted to take control of their own lives, wanted to take control of their own destiny instead of being in submission to God. Now, as I said earlier, the three battlegrounds in which all of this gets played out are in society and in the church and in our minds. As far as Satan's work in society goes, all we've really got to do is watch the news, right? Or look at a newspaper and, and see all of the evidence that is there in front of us that he's probably being pretty successful at his work. As for his work in the church, all that we have to do is dig deeply into the history of just about any congregation that we might name or think of and see all of the strife and tension and division that has arisen over the course of time, over this matter and that matter, to see that Satan has probably been pretty successful at his plan. And as for Satan's work in our minds, all we have to do, as Dave encouraged us to do this morning, is to take a good, hard, long, honest look at our lives and see that there are traps that he has laid for us that we have fallen right into. And he's been successful with us too. Not to give him any credit, believe me. But praise God, friends, we can be forgiven. Not just can be, we are forgiven. We can do better. We can learn from our mistakes. We can be lifted up and cleansed anew by the power and the blood of Christ. And we can give it, be given a new, fresh beginning every day. That's the gospel. was reading some information in my file on spiritual warfare this week and was caught um, by this article that's about 15 years old now, but I thought, wow, this is, this is still relevant for today. Uh, look at this statistic about how the devil is leading people into sin in just one arena, okay? In 2003, Christian World News did a press release called Drawn to Darkness, the Allure of the Occult, in which they stated that 86% of kids watch supernatural-themed movies and TV shows on a regular basis. 86%. And nearly 66% of teens, two-thirds of teenagers, doesn't differentiate between church-going teens, non-church-going, doesn't differentiate, say that they have participated in at least one occult-oriented activity. For teens to be involved in uh, the dark side and in witchcraft can be something that is perceived by their peers as kind of cool. Maybe it's not the same now as it was a few years ago, but I remember kids thinking, oh, that's, that's kind of edgy, that's kind of cool, what's that like? If you go to a large secular bookstore, you will, I think undoubtedly, I haven't been in one in a while, but you'll find a book section, a resource section related to witchcraft and the occult. I'm pretty sure it's there. That most likely will include something akin to a teen witch kit. A teen witch kit. I've seen these, maybe you've seen them too. Uh, they come with a pentagram, uh, a crystal, a guidebook, other resources. Uh, sometimes the box even turns into a satanic altar. You can convert it into an altar. It's all designed to help curious kids learn how to um, speak curses and how to enter into the dark world of the occult and witchcraft. It's a trap of the enemy, obviously. It's very dangerous, has very dangerous consequences. And there are stories from all around our country about it actually leading to death because kids got involved, they got drawn in farther than they ever thought it would go, and all of a sudden somebody's dead. So parents, 
beware. You must know and you should be asking what your children are into. These things are not innocent games. If your kids are playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, and some would accuse me of being old-fashioned and stupid, raka, because I say that, but I submit to you that it's true, or they're messing around with a Ouija board, or they're listening to some secular music that has very dark and harmful lyrics, they could already be on that slippery slope of entering into the world of Satanism and the occult. One of your primary jobs as a Christian parent is to safeguard and to protect your children. It's, I think it's part and parcel of the vows that we take in infant baptism. But to protect them from this spiritual war and from what Satan would like to do in their lives. He wants to keep them from Christ, right? I'm not generally an advocate for sheltering and protecting our children from things of the world. I think that they, they need to uh, learn how to become strong, bold, courageous Christians uh, by being exposed to things. And then we teach them how as disciples to respond to that. But friends, when it comes to this kind of stuff, spiritual warfare, I'm opposed to that. I think you should shelter your kids when it comes to that. Keep them from it. Jesus told us exactly what the work of the devil is in John 10, verse 10. Take a look. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Beloved, that is what Satan wants to do to you and your children and your grandchildren. This is serious. And remember that according to... 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, Satan often comes to us masked as an angel of light. He comes looking good. He appears harmless. He talks smooth. He can even make a, a certain amount of sense, especially to a young, susceptible child. He can make the ways of darkness look very appealing, very fun, very exciting. But it's all a trap, right? It's all a trap. It's a snare because he's a liar. He's the father of lies. And his real goal, his real objective is to steal and kill and destroy. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The main lure and lie of the New Age movement, which has been around now for, what, 20, 30 years is that you have a power within you. And you can learn to tap into even greater power. You can become all that you were meant to be. It's funny, that reminds me of the old slogan that was used in the army, remember that? Be all that you can be. And what's so bad about that, right? I mean, that's, isn't that good? We should be all that we can be? Well, what's the theology behind it? It is that you are the center of the universe. You're a little God, small g. And you owe it to yourself. You owe it to the world to become an even greater God, to become more, to lay hold of the power that you can have. That was... Part of the ploy, remember, that Satan used with, with Adam and Eve in the garden? Your eyes will be opened. You'll gain knowledge and you'll be like God. It goes back to the beginning. But the Bible tells us that again and again and again there's only one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that we are mere cre creatures made in his image. The only way that you could possibly redeem that lie of Satan is to say, no, I can only do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We're supposed to be like Christ. But we need to remember that Christ was filled with humility. He was filled with reverence and submission, and he was radically obedient to the Father. Never tried to usurp the Father's place in any decision. 
even though he was co-equal with God. Could have tried. He said, no, I'll never do that. So that brings us to the last thing this morning, that we must know and trust Jesus Christ to deliver us from all evil. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we ask for that, don't we? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're asking, Father, don't let us be drawn into the snares and the devices of Satan. But deliver us from him and all that he's trying to do in my life and in the lives of my children and grandchildren. And you know the comforting thing about that is that Jesus Christ actually really has the authority to accomplish that, to deliver us from evil. He really does. The reformers of the 16th century who helped to shape much of the faith that most of us embrace today uh, ask this question in the Heidelberg Catechism. We, we know this, most of us. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And if your memory is better than mine, you will know that the answer is that I am not my own, but that I belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. But then the writers of the catechism went on to list some of the things that Jesus actually did to make us his own. It goes on, he fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. And then what's the next thing? He has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. So here's the thing. If you have not come into the freedom of a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you are subject to the tyranny of Satan. Now, don't gaff that off. So what's tyranny? Looked it up in the dictionary. Kind of an interesting definition. Cruelty and injustice in the exercise of power or authority over others. We're thinking about Satan now. Oppressive government by one or more people, the devil, who exercise absolute power cruelly and unjustly. We understand tyranny to be the kind of behavior that people like Saddam Hussein and Idi Amin and Adolf Hitler and other tyrants of history uh, are said to be guilty of. A tyrant is out to control you and to use you. And they will abuse you and manipulate you and torture you and do anything that they have to do to get you to do what they want you to do. That's what a tyrant is. And that's what Satan is up to. He is a tyrant. Jesus, on the other hand, comes to do just the opposite and to oppose all those who would do that to any human being, believer or not. Let's look at what Jesus said in Luke 4 about the purpose of his life and his ministry. Luke 4, 18 and 19, the spirit, this is from Isaiah, he's quoting Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So when Jesus said that in his own hometown, in the synagogue of his hometown in Nazareth, he spoke with great authority. And by claiming that he fulfilled that prophecy from Isaiah 800 years before, Jesus forthrightly declared himself to be the Son of God, the Anointed One, the Messiah. Luke tells us in his gospel that people were amazed when they heard Jesus say that and all of his teaching. And Mark tells us twice in our text today that the people were astonished because Jesus taught as one who had authority, and they said, my word, even the demons submit to him. Wow. This exorcism was a clear demonstration of the authority of the Son of God. Jesus has real power, friends. And listen, if Jesus possesses a power that is greater than evil spirits and greater than Satan himself, and they have to do what he commands, then he proves that he is the ruler over the entire spirit world, over all principalities and powers. 
So only Jesus has the power to set you free from the tyranny of the devil. Okay, let's bring it home. Are you sick and tired of alcohol or drugs or cigarettes or food or anything else controlling your life? Are you wearied because you fall back into pornography or gambling or stealing or something else again and again and again? And are you exhausted and empty because you have been fighting a constant battle with depression or with worry or with anxiety? And you just find that the medications that the doctor is giving you don't help. Friends, Jesus has the power to deliver you. Many of us recognize and we confess that Jesus has the power to forgive our sins. Jesus has the power to hear and to answer our prayers. He can heal us of illness and injury. He can help us through our temptations and deliver us from those. But do we believe that Jesus has the power to overcome and give us victory in those kinds of things that I just mentioned to you? Jesus declared, did he not, all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to me. That means he has authority over this troubling situation or conflict in your life. Jesus has the power to deliver you from anything that is not of God. And, and the problem that I sense in so much of the evangelical church is that we kind of give an intellectual assent to this. We, we, we say, yeah, 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 I think that's true. And we kind of give lip service to it. But then we just fail to call upon the name of the Lord, to call upon the power of Jesus to win the battles that we're facing. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free indeed. Don't you want that this morning? What is it in your life? Isn't it time that you were freed once and for all from the power of anger or greed or jealousy or you name it, whatever it is in your life that's not of God, isn't it time? I'm telling you that Jesus is the only one that has the power to do this. I know, I have tried in my own life to win victory over besetting sins and to do it in my own strength. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps, you know. I'm going to lick this thing. I'm just going to have a little bit more discipline. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to... And I don't call upon the name of the Lord. I don't cry out to Jesus. Like Peter sinking on the waves when he stepped out of the boat. Took his eyes off Jesus and whoop, down he went. That's where we're going to go without Jesus, right? We're going to sink. So this morning I want us to just close in prayer. And I want to lead us in a prayer for victory, okay? Let's, let's bow our heads. Pray with me, please. Risen Jesus, you are our living hope. You are the victor. You conquered death. You were victorious over Satan and sin, the grave. You demonstrated the truth that all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. And Lord Jesus, you showed us through the exorcisms and the healings and the resurrections of others in the Gospels that you truly had that power. You didn't just say it, you showed that you possessed that power. And Scripture's witness is that, Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You do not change because you are the immutable God. And we can call upon you for help. And that's what we want to do right now. Lord, you see everything in our lives, everything in our hearts. 
You know our waywardness. You know our rebelliousness. You know how slack we can be, how undisciplined we can be, how we falter, how we fail, how we betray you time and time again. And yet, Lord, your love doesn't change. Your mercy is fresh and new to us every single morning. Your forgiveness is available to us as long as we humbly repent and we cry out to you, come, Lord Jesus, come and cleanse me. Forgive me and make me new again today. And Lord, that's what we need. But we want your power over our lives, Lord, to walk, as Paul said in Romans 8, as more than conquerors through him who loved us. Lord, would you give us that victory today by the power of your name, by the power of your blood, by the power of your word written for us and for our salvation, by the power of your righteousness that lives in us because of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm in your presence right now and you see all of me, everything about me. And you can change what is not of you. You can take it from me. Speak the word, O oh Lord. Speak the word and it shall be gone. Because demons and unclean spirits and rebellious thoughts and attitudes cannot remain where you exercise your mighty word. Set us free, O oh Lord, by the truth you have given us this morning. And we thank you. We bless you. We praise your holy name. And we ask all this in your glorious, majestic, and powerful name. And Lord, as we give now in response to this word of our tithes and offerings, we pray that you would bless them. Use them and use us, O oh Lord, even as the givers. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with. Take just this portion, Lord, and use it to bring this good news of the gospel, this life-changing um, freedom giving, this liberating good news of the gospel to people everywhere around Forest Grove and throughout our world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.